So the the CDC calls trauma the most significant uh, public health uh, crisis for children um, today. No time, no tools, big expectations. How do you transform school culture without derailing the train? Answer, little wins that bring big changes. The flywheel effect, harnessing the power of momentum to create a school culture that celebrates change and drives itself. Hello and welcome. My name is Jordan Pruitt. I'm here on the Flywheel Effect with my co-host, Anna Murphy. We're both former educators working with the live school team, Support Your School's Culture Vision. Uh, we're joined by our guest today, Mr. Todd Finley. He is an associate professor of English at East Carolina University and a former K-12 teacher. Um, Todd, I'm going to hand it off to you. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Uh, so I work at East Carolina University, which is the greatest university in the world. Um, I'm the coordinator of, of the English education program. Uh, I've done a lot of writing for Edutopia, and I do a lot of social media and educational posts on Twitter. So that's enough about me. Well, thank you for coming on, Todd. That, and the, the, your social media is actually how I found you because I, I saw a lot of the resources you were putting out, um, and they're they're really helpful. They're really well done. And I thought, you know, he's probably going to have some some good things to say about school culture. So so here we are. And um, Anna, you got anything before we get started? No, I'm, I'm just really eager, I think, to learn about this is the question we usually ask at the beginning of all interviews is tell us about your first job in education. And before, you know, East Carolina University, working as administrator, like what was your very, very, very first job within education? Yes. So first, let me tell you that I was like one of those uh, kind of perfectionistic students in uh, like all through school. And then my first job of teaching was at a school called Heart of the Earth. It no longer exists, but it used to be right next to the University of Minnesota. And uh, I was I was actually hired two weeks into the school year. And uh, I found out later, not right away, that three English teachers had quit within the first two weeks. So, um, so I came next. And then I, fi- I really quickly found out why um, within the first five minutes of class, and actually I was teaching middle, middle grades through high school at that time, um, uh, there was an eighth grader and his name was Rock, which is really appropriate because he, he all of a sudden just sort of manifested a rock in his hands like that big. And uh, like for a little kid, like, uh, like my first thought is, why is there a rock in the room? <laughs> and then uh, he throws it at me and I, and I dodge because, you know, when you're, a stone doesn't go that fast, you know, so I k- kind of did this and did the sort of art over my shoulder, <laughs> hit the chalkboard, cracked it. And I remember my first thought was, I, I wonder if the teachers down the hall heard that. <laughs> so shame based, have I been caught? And then my second thought was, oh boy, this is really bad. <laughs> this is, this is really, really bad. And then my next thought was, well, it can't get any worse, right? <laughs> but it actually did. So uh, that year was was really formative to me. The school was in chaos. Um, there was a lot of gang culture. There was a lot of drugs and poverty and all that. So that was a really, really tough year. But I kind of feel like my entire professional life has been figuring out, like, what could I have done differently to have not had the troubles that I had that first year of teaching? The... Um... <clears throat> First off, on the rock, was it like in his backpack or something? Or do he carry it in? Like, like Fred you know, it was, or? I'm, I'm probably guessing that I was so in my head at the time as like first time teaching, you got all that adrenaline going. My, my thought is probably that it was just probably laying by his uh, like uh, book bag or something. And that like looking at everything and just being overwhelmed, I just probably didn't see it. <laughs> That's my hypothesis. Folks probably have this, um, they probably have this kind of phenomenon in other professions too, but the, um, the, like the horror stories about like the person that came before you and like whatever office you're, you're going into or classroom, those are always fun. Um, because I mean, sometimes they're not true or they're exaggerators or then sometimes they're true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I, I did like later that year, I, I actually had, um, I, I was in the bathroom and there was a kid who came in masked, like a big kid. So I didn't know who it was. It wasn't a kid that I taught. And he came in with a Bowie knife. 
and just started making jabbing motions at me. It's like, okay, this is way too much for me. So yeah, there were quite a few horror um, stories that occurred um, that year, but things aren't that bad in most schools now. So that was just a really unusual circumstance. That 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 is that's a wild story. Um, I've got not not like not quite to that extent, but I've, I've I have I've seen quite a lot of things and like. I, I was a dean and had, had to do searches and stuff and had to had to confiscate stuff. So I, I had some experience with that kind of thing. My first year of teaching, um, I had not the rock story, but I had like an unusual amount of like altercations right outside my door. And it took me probably like two months to figure out why that was happening. It was because like that first year of teaching, you're, you're working on planning so much. And like, I was constantly like prepping for the next class in between classes. Like I would change, I would be wiping off the board and changing things. So I didn't like go, it's just such a simple thing to go stand outside your door. But like there had, I had like created this vacuum outside my door and like, so things kept happening right there. And finally they were like, well, Jordan, you gotta, you gotta go stand outside the door so they don't go there. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny though, like some of the things that veteran teachers just just do, and for rookie teachers, like none of those are intuitive. You just haven't really thought through those experiences yet. So we we should forgive ourselves. Yeah, yeah, and we, and we're going to talk a little bit about um, teacher prep. That's one of the things that's going to come up. But we, I, th- I found that we we don't really prep them for all those little things. Like uh, we're, we're pretty good about teaching teaching pedagogy and, like, and how to deliver content stuff, but the things that make them get through their day, not, not as much. Oh, I was just going to say, yeah. I think the reason is because there's, there's this difference between complicated and complex, like complicated is your, uh, your telephone, the insides of your telephone or your cell phone. (laughs) Um, and then complex is like a pool game where you, you can't, uh, really anticipate all the different variables that are going to occur. So you just have to get candidates who are just really present and awake and are able to respond in a way that's nimble. Um, I, I, I think, cause really, I mean, you could just, you could just shove a whole lot of information at teacher candidates and you still can't prepare them for th- these, these things that they could never have anticipated. That, that That's a great point. It kind of, speaks to the folks who, who end up being successful in the field. You, you got to be able to think on your feet and be flexible and, and you got to, got to bring some life experiences into the job that from yourself. Um, that, that brings us to what I, what I wanted to ask you about. Cause I, I saw that you'd worked at all, all three levels in K-12 and elementary, middle and high. And, and now you're a professor. So, um, that that's, that's unique in our profession. Um, what can you tell me something that you've, you've learned from each level? Like what, what'd you pick up? What's different? Yeah. So as an elementary teacher, I learned that you, you better like doing crafts on the weekend and at night, like just a lot of scissors, a lot of cutting, a lot of paste. And as a middle grades teacher, I learned that it was important to find a way to say, I see greatness in you, even without saying those exact words. And then at the high school level, I really learned that gamification works as great at that level as it does in middle grades and um, elementary school. One other thing I want to say about um, high school is there's sometimes uh, parents might think that the job is harder at the high school level because the content is uh, deeper, broader, more sophisticated than elementary school. But the real talent is in the elementary grades. Like the the lower you go, the more talented the individuals that you have the 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 knowledge about pedagogy and uh, and uh, content, a, a range of, of content, how to deal with all these situations. Elementary teachers are superstars. And then at the university level, I learned that students don't need me to be perfect or brilliant. What they need is for me in my words and my actions to convey the idea that they are fundamentally uh, fundamentally significant and and if you're doing that and connecting their lives to the content area then all of a sudden you're you're, you're doing uh, less sort of directive kind of teaching and they're leaning forward and hungry for the content so there's there's all sorts of like awesome takeaways from that um, first of all, it's really cool that you've got this, you have to experience all those levels because you end up kind of, um, 
I, most of us end up being somewhere most of our career, even administrators. Like, like if you're in high school, you end up being an administrator in high school because that, that's, that's what you know. You know what I mean? So often, oftentimes you don't get to see the other levels, at least in, in detail. Um, I can speak to uh, there were several things that you said there. I, my wife is an elementary teacher and I've said, I've said it on the podcast once or twice before, uh, but, but she's way more talented than me uh, as far as the teachers go. <laughs> um, so I, I can, I can lean on that a little bit. Um, that, that, brings true to me. Um, and the gamification thing you mentioned for high school, that's something that I, I leaned on a lot at, at, as a teacher and it, it worked really effectively. It was a way to keep, keep them engaged and, um, pretty regular basis. You, you'd find ways to be competitive in the classroom. I, I was a, a science teacher and there's a lot of ways you could do it. And it, it, it helped a lot. Um, what you said about, uh, middle school, could, could you deep dive into that just a little bit more? Cause I think that is, um, that, that, that's very interesting. Yeah. Uh, well, the, the notion that you that you need to convey to students that they have uh, not only potential uh, to do great things, but you see them as being uh, as having the ability right then to to have a real impact on the world, and th- that also that they have an impact on you, that you really enjoy them. So, um, some of that is relationship building stuff, but. Uh, a lot of that is f- just finding the way to say that in a way that students can can hear it. And, and I found that uh, in some ways I wasn't suited to middle grades teaching. A- and that's because I've noticed that as I've observed um, many middle grades teachers, that they have a level of snark about them that r- really connects them with their students. And I'm really not good at snarky. Um, and th- and they so they have this they have this uh, just this verbal ab- ability to interact with kids in a very playful way and sometimes they say super insulting things that the kids still think is like oh that's great I'm getting this attention like they they have all all that going for them um, but I find that if you are uh, one of those adults that really sees a student and and um, sees the best in students that students will feel that and uh, that will be transformational for them. They will remember you forever and that will animate their their lives for decades to come by, by you just having just one simple conversation like that with them. Um, and I can, I've, um, it's kind of funny, like yesterday in my methods classes, I asked my uh, students to come up with their five most significant educational experiences. And uh, almost all of them talked about this one teacher that saw them, that saw the best in them, and was able to speak to that part in a way that inspired them. So <clears throat> part of my, my job now is that I, I write a lot of pieces and I, I edit our, our blog and we provide um, resources for classroom management, school culture, PBIS, that kind of thing. And I recently wrote a post about middle school classroom management. And I, I spent a little bit of time in middle school Um I did like a, a STEM class in, in middle school. Like I spent half my day in the high school and I, I would go to the middle school in the afternoons because like we shared a campus. Um, and what, what you said about um, the, the, the level of snarkiness, um, I, I wanted to find a way to put that in words in, in the blog because I, I saw kind of a similar thing. They roll with the punches, you know what I mean? But it was just hard to like write that. It, it may it, it come across as well as you put it. So I, thank you for saying that because I, I struggled to put that on paper not long ago. Uh, but that, that's a thing because they can kind of they can kind of roll with the the level of humor that middle schoolers uniquely have. <laughs> um, the next thing I wanted to ask about, um, can you the, you know specifically to the little stretch we went through in education that's been really tough? How has teacher prep changed over this last little stretch, particularly the last two three years? Um, well, uh, I'm thinking that the two most significant things that have happened to us as a country has been COVID, um, which is sort of obvious. It's so omnipresent that we sometimes don't even talk about it anymore. It's just like it has infused our culture now. And then also George Floyd. And uh, both of those have accelerated a reform in teacher education. And, uh, and they've done this because they've highlighted how vulnerable it is to be a part of a marginalized group. And uh, I, I think about this one statistic that in the U.S., black people comprise 39% of all the COVID deaths, which is 
a, a horrible, horrible figure. But then you think that African American African Americans. Uh, uh, that population is only 13% of the entire population, and that number becomes catastrophic. So the ways in which uh, COVID has attacked us unfairly, um, depending on where you were, uh, w- what uh, cultural, racial group that you belong to, um, it's been super unfair. And so in teacher preparation, we've responded in a few different ways. One is that we have more DEI or diversity um, equity and inclusion curriculum. So we're looking at things like uh, implicit bias more. We're looking at microaggressions. And then like in my department, all of the faculty are have uh, rigorously looked at every single one of their course readings, their textbooks, the readings, the research articles that we share with students. And we're just looking at our, all the authors, um, old white guys like me, or do you actually have a range of diverse uh, of voices, uh, and this has also made me more sensitive as a uh, as a teacher. I've, uh, in we have a largely white female population in English education. Um, women like to go into English teaching, and men tend to go more into history teaching, which is great because I get to work with superstar women, and uh, they're they're so smart and so capable. Um, and a fraction of that population um, are African American students. I've just noticed that. Um, that the the kind of barriers to them being successful in, in, in education are uh, are profound sometimes sometimes they're taking care of family members and they're they are the manager at McDonald's and they're taking full-time classes and and so uh, one of the things that, that I have done a, a better job with and I, and I actually don't do this with my white students but um, I will actually end up, if I see uh, a student so, uh, starting to kind of disappear, I call them ghosting. <laughs> they're, they're just kind of disappearing. They don't quite come to class as much. They're not really t- turning things in. I'll just call them and, and say, and by the way, it really freaks um, students out when a professor calls, calls them you know, at work. Hey, um, I'm Todd. I'm your professor. <laughs> and I'll, I'll say, hey, you're not, you're not doing as great as I think you could be doing. And what can I do to help? Because... I want to help you be really successful in this classroom and I want you to get into classroom. So I've, I've noticed that just more reaching out and understanding some of the pressures, institutional and otherwise social pressures that are affecting our bl- black students um, are things that I've never had to deal with, um, um, with the kind of uh, privilege in upbringing that I had. So, uh, so DEI curriculum has been forwarded uh, because of COVID and George Floyd. We are also doing far more relationship building training. So it's not just teaching content. And uh, some people think that you cannot teach charisma, but you actually can because uh, charisma is two factors. This is, comes from Vanessa Van Edwards. It, it involves competency and it also involves empathy. So if you have competency and empathy, both of those two things um, are skills. And so like Kung Fu... A skill is uh, something that you can get better at. So you can get better at relationship, um, at, at um, having more of an impact and having closer relationships and getting closer to your students and understanding them better. And I, I'd say one of the ways that we do that is through more simulations. So last week we did a simulation on how do you take away a kid's donut um, without them getting pissed off at you. Um, another thing that um, we'll do later on is um, what happens if a student says something racist to you or something racist in the class or homophobic or uh, another one that we do sort of early on in the program is so ask a student about their weekend and then just practice asking a follow-up question which is like uh, they don't have that training and and frankly I need those things too because I grew up with wolves so it's uh, it's helpful for them to become more nimble in their conversations. It, and it also um, in these conversations, if they find themselves having trouble, well, then they can sort of rethink those conversations and what they might do in the classroom. So we uh, we practice getting closer to our students and through relationship building, um, we get to know our students better and that, that makes us more effective as teachers. And then the, uh, just finally, uh, brain-based teaching has been around for a while now. And with the explosion of, uh, of neuroscience, uh, we're doing far more of that. 
And, and I'd, I'd recommend two resources for that. One is The Extended Mind by Anne Murphy Paul, which came out the summer before last. And then also Brainstorm by Daniel Siegel. It's really opened up how we, uh, how we can really harness the power of students' brains. So kind of, kind of the key takeaway from what you're saying there and, and like, I, as a lot of people listen to this, I, I've you know experienced all the things you were, you were saying and the, um, it, it feels like a shift from learning how to teach this as opposed to who you're teaching. You know what I mean? And less, less about the, the less about the what and more about the who, if, if that makes sense, which I think that's going to be really vital for educators to be successful now. And it just, and it, and it, it just makes sense. But some, some of the stuff, a lot of things, the things we should have been doing a long time ago. And I think it's really going to help. Um, one thing I really was interested in hearing you say there was the idea of teaching charisma. Um, that, that's a really cool idea because, the, the folks, um, and I, I know high school more than anything else, but I mean, I'm sure it stays true everywhere else, but the folks who are really successful, like they can kind of work a room, you know what I mean? Like, and they've got a little bit of charisma to them. Like if, if you can keep, you know, 30 teenagers interested, like that's, it's quite a, quite a skill. And I didn't really think of it as something that could be like taught and practiced ahead of time, but uh, you guys are working on it. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about like the, the donut exercise you did? Because that that rings true to a lot of the behavior things that we find that they start with something really small and the redirection goes goes poorly and it, it triggers something much larger and it, it's it's either like it's it's food or it's like you know it's a dress code thing like taking a hood down or something and it escalates into something it never needed to be can you walk us through how it went in your class <laughs> sure so really that's a uh, that's a classroom management issue right so a, yeah. a student is breaking the rule which is to have a they're, they're sitting and munching on a donut in your class and you have a rule that all the students know that you you know you're not eating in class for example if that's if you have that particular rule and uh, a lot of uh, teachers react uh, really quickly they get really quickly to um, to anger when the rules are being violated it, um, sometimes we call that getting in the red. So if you get in the red and the students get in the red, you have you know you have a lot of conflict. So the classroom management principle here is that you want to use the very um, lowest intervention. I call them like your your uh, you have the most lethal weapons, which is get out of my classroom, go to the principal's office. Well, then you're suspended. And if you do that when a kid accidentally says shit, then I'm sorry if I'm I'm not supposed to swear. But if you, you're fine, okay. If you say that. Um, after a kid blurts out something just sort of accidentally, um, like that, and you say, go to the principal's office. Well, you've already used one of your main weapons first when a a lower level intervention would work uh, much better. So, and I actually, uh, I do this simulation because I saw a teacher do this brilliantly, brilliantly once. And she did this. She, she, um, saw the kid in her classroom with a donut (laughs) And the first thing she said was, oh, my goodness, that donut looks so good. Oh, I wish I could have that right now, but got to put it away. And then she just turned around. Um, and that was it. So like, who wouldn't want to have a donut in the classroom, right? So acknowledging acknowledging that, you know, and the kid, and the kid put it away. Um, so, and then oftentimes, uh, like uh, sometimes your intervention is, is uh, not even using words which is just sort of just standing a proximity, just a little closer to the student. <laughs> Maybe just just slight, just so they kind of notice you're there and are feeling a little uncomfortable, just doing, doing that. So rookie teachers tend to, when they're first teaching, they stand against the, the, uh, the front of the wall, like with their back against the wall, as far away from the scary students as possible. They're, and they're afraid to turn around. <laughs> <laughs> they are um, not all not all pre-service teachers are like that but um i just say just use your use your body and use your voice those are your tools and um and that can be really powerful and oprah says uh you can't be powerful in the world unless you know that you're powerful and so um and i, I should say that there is not one way to address any of these things and uh, that's why we do the simulations so uh, and I'll just kind of let me just uh, tell you what we do. So I get the student standing around in a in a uh, in a circle, and then like yesterday I played the student. Um, and so 
will have some kind of issue that comes up and each student will interact with me um, as the teacher. Um, and then the next one to go and the ne- next one, the next, next one goes and just till we go around and everyone has interacted in some way to sort of problem solve the situation. We debrief that and talk about what people did differently, what they did well. We don't talk about what people didn't do well because they, they know. <laughs> and then we do it again and just have them change up their, uh, their approach and in this way, they start to expand their tool belt of approaches that they could take for those kind of interactions. So that, that sounds incredibly valuable. Um, I used to do a, a training for my staff <clears throat> that was, um, it, it was classroom management training. And what it, the re- reason I did it that way was I wanted to teach them like basically the difference in like what, what's an office uh, referral and what, what should you just handle? And, and you used a very similar verb as I use is what's the least disruptive way for me to handle this. And, and you kind of put it, put it like, put the ownership on yourself. All right. There's this behavior happening. If I handle it this way, do I make it worse? Do I have to do anything at all? Can I just go stand by them and it, it and it be over that proximity idea is, is a big one. And your, your voice and your body, you, that's what you have. And don't jump to the nuclear level. Cause then you've, you've already used it. <laughs> Um, that's, that's huge. Um, the other thing on, on the donut and the, that, that little, little cue the teacher used about, Oh, it looks great. I wish I could have it right now. I used to use that. That was kind of my go-to move for cell phones. Um, and I, I, I can kind of, you can probably even tell by the year I was teaching about like the apps that were huge at the time. But one of my, when I was, um, a, a new teacher, one of the, the most frequently used apps was a, a trivia app. Um, it might've been go trivia. I don't know. I don't remember the trivia app's name. It may have just been trivia app, but everyone was playing trivia at all times. And my go-to when I saw a kid out on their phone, because like nine out of 10 times, it was this trivia game. I just walked by, I look over the shoulder. I'd answer the question and say, all right, you're welcome. Put it away. <laughs> and I, or if it was candy crush, I'd walk by and I'd say, um, I'm actually on a higher level and you, sorry, you're going to put that away. So, yeah, you could do it without being like, all right, give me the phone, because then you're escalating it for no reason. Yeah. 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 And you know what I love about, uh, as you describe that, is to do that, to say I'm at a higher level, you're relaxed. And it's also like you're actually enjoying being you in that moment. And I, and I think so many of our pre-service teachers, they've really n- never had to... Uh, they've had very few experiences where they've asked another human being to stop doing what they're doing and then do something else. And, and so their vocabulary for that is limited. So providing a script for that and then just getting them so that they are, uh, enjoy being who they are in that role in that moment is that, that is a skill set to develop that being super comfortable and present and then being kind of nimble and how you respond to those kind of interactions. So it's, it's cool how, uh, relaxed, playful, and creative in the moment you were in that interaction. Yeah. And that, you know, being kind of playful and creative and, and confident is, is and that, that goes back to your, your charisma thought. And, and that's a skill you can develop. Um, because if, if you're not those things, people pick up on those things. And uh, even if you've ever been in like a PD and um, if, if, if like, I think these teachers are on their phones and PDs a lot, that happens a lot. If the presenter like doesn't handle it well, it kind of puts up this like weird block between who they're presenting with. So like if they come in and they're just like, all right, you need to put those away. Like they kind of get a little um, harsh. It doesn't really go well, if, even with adults. But if they kind of make make a little joke about it, then everybody's OK, I'm in. I, I'll put it away. Um, yeah. And it's never a good idea to teach your uh, or, or treat your your teachers or the people that you're doing PD with like they're uh, middle graders. Just, that's just not great. Even if they're acting like it, you just don't do that. No, no, it's a bad idea. Um, we have a, a quick break here in the middle. So like this part right here gets edited and then I put in an ad. Um, if, if you need to get a fill a drink of water, now's like great time. Or I mean, you can drink water anytime you want, but like if you need a refill. Um, and if, if you're ready to keep going, we'll, we'll keep rolling. Okay, so uh, when we talked earlier... Uh, but before the show, you mentioned trauma-informed teaching. Um, what can you tell us about that for any listeners that don't know what that means? Sure. Uh, well, first, let me tell you, tell you why I think it's important. Uh, 70% of U.S. children uh, have experienced, before they're 18, 
uh, serious trauma. So the the CDC calls trauma the most significant uh, public health uh, crisis for children um, today. And so uh, trauma is defined as a painful event or uh, or a series of events that kids are having a hard time getting over. Uh, they're, they're bad experiences and and uh, and sometimes uh, kids aren't helped with dealing with those. And so if you think about this, you experience a trauma a traumatic event and maybe your brain loops about it um, for a long long time or maybe you've had uh, maybe you have uh, abusive guardians or something like that and um, something happens for a long time, which has happened to a lot of people. Um, what happens then is you have kids who are actually drowning in the stress hormone cortisol uh, and they're super adrenalized. And by the way, um, cortisol interacts with the hippocampus. The hippocampus is the memory center of the brain. It interacts with it like poison. So it it really degrades students' ability to uh, rec- recall things, to remember them later. Uh, and you could sort of imagine in this hyperadrenalized cortisol state, like, like you have a kid who's sitting at their desk and they're trying to pay attention to a teacher's lecture. And, and meanwhile, you just imagine them sort of feeling like there is a wild Kodiak bear behind them that's unchained. They can sort of feel its breath. So it, it completely interferes with students' executive function, their ability to be uh, effective. Um, to, it interferes with their learning and also it it really steals kids from their from their childhood so uh so that's so that's trauma uh, trauma is dramatic and then you have uh, trauma informed instruction which essentially involves two steps um, one is understanding how trauma can impact learning and behavior so it's an identification kind of thing like is that are those indicators uh uh an indicator that the student has experienced some kind of trauma or are still dealing with trauma. And the other thing is finding a way to better support students who may be experiencing trauma. And uh, so what I really like about uh, the science of trauma-informed instruction is that it's giving us uh, tools that we didn't have before. And so I'll just give one example. Sorry, I'm dehydrated. So... Um, let's say you have a kid and this has happened to me, has happened to a lot of teachers, an eighth grade uh, student takes their algebra textbook in the middle of class and just slams it on the floor really loudly. Uh, Maybe they yell too. Well, in the past, one of the strategies that uh, almost all teachers have been told to do is that we should ignore acting out behavior. And the logic is that attention seekers are craving attention. And so you don't want to reward that. And if you, the idea being that if you ignore that, then eventually those kind of behaviors will be extinguished. That's sort of a classic classroom management uh, principle. Well, it's trauma informed instruction says, okay, that might work in some situations, but what happens if you're dealing with a specific kid who is, who, who the trauma is chronic neglect? Well, then if you're ignoring the child, then you're compounding the trauma and you can get a, an even bigger blow up. So, so instead of just like, you know, turning your head and dealing with something else and, and ignoring them, um, instead, uh, a teacher might say something like, uh, you must be so upset right now. I'm so sorry. How can I help? Now, you could certainly deal, you know, your next step or after you deal with whatever's going on, then you can say, well, let's find better ways than destroying our textbooks. You know, you could, you could, you could certainly have that conversation with them, but the instinct to ignore or first yell it at the kid um, can actually exacerbate the, uh, exacerbate the trauma. Um, and so uh, I guess uh, the, uh, the big takeaway for me about trauma-informed instruction is that we're all made of feelings. And for some kids, those feelings are bone crushing. And we need uh, better, sharper, more specific, sharper. We need better, more specific t- tools to uh, deal with kids who are um, are suffering from trauma. And uh, and honestly, when you look at the research of uh, what kids have been going through for the last uh, last a couple of years, uh, particularly with with COVID, 
um, a lot of them have been very traumatized with that. And so uh, teachers just uh, need more tools to be more effective with them. So a a lot of that rings true to me. Uh, Somebody who was dealing with the behaviors on pretty much my entire day. Um, The folks that, and this kind of comes true to a lot of the the kids who get in trouble a lot, um, particularly for the more intense behaviors, because they're, they're they're kind of on edge and it it doesn't appear there's any reason why, you know what I mean? Like nothing has happened during the school day. They're just on edge. And it's exactly what you're saying. It it didn't happen during the school day. They they brought it with them. Um, And just having a level of empathy for them and realizing that that this behavior really isn't directed at me. Um, I, you know what I mean? And and so there's no reason for me to elevate as well. Um, I, I should not take this personal. Like, they, they brought this with them and then we, we had to work through it. Yeah. I have to, can I just tell you about, uh, I had a, um, a pre service teacher who became a teacher and, um, she actually grew up in poverty and in a really rough area. Um, and she, I, I kind of checked in with her a few years later after she'd been teaching for a while and she came into actually to our master's program. And so I interacted with her there and, uh, she had been so effective with uh, the ninth graders in this really tough community, poverty, gangs, lots of abuse. And, and she insisted on working with the repeaters and they didn't want her to because they said, you're so effective. What we want you to do is be working with in these grades with these kids because that will impact their test scores. And she said, um, so no, I want to work with the ninth graders and the repeaters and strugglers because they need me more. And if you insist that I go in these other grades, I will go to a different school. And by the way, she was sort of legendary at this point. And so she could have gotten a job anywhere. But uh, And one of the things she did, which I thought was interesting, I, I, honestly, uh, I spent hours and hours talking to her about what she was doing, just try, to try and figure out what was working for her and how she was able to reach these kids when others couldn't. And I'll just tell you one thing that she did. Every single class she would start with 10 minutes. These are hour and a half classes. She'd start with 10 minutes of uh, teaching them about stress, about fear and anger and how to deal with it by things like, say, box breathing, where you inhale for four seconds, hold it for four seconds, exhale for four seconds. Like So so she just dealt with like anger management stuff. And the, the kids loved her. That, that doesn't mean that's all she did the entire period. She did a whole lot of content and was very successful in getting students to... Uh, be su- uh, to be successful, um, but she took the time in class to really deal with the uh, emotional issues that were impacting uh, the students. And if you are uh, if you are intent on helping students with trauma, then there are ways to go about it. And trauma informed instruction is a good way to start. So, uh, first off, I, I've worked with a few folks like like you like you're mentioning. They are worth twice what we pay them. They 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 are incredible folks, and they they're few and far between. And, and we need more of them. And the the second thing I would say about that is a lot of times you'll you'll hear a little bit of pushback on things like that, like that. The, the ten minutes for 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 stress relief and anger management. Um, for the folks that have not been in classrooms like that with, with students like that, that 10 minutes a, a day was, was probably the difference in her getting any content in at all. And, and, and then passing um, like that, the, the time investment there is, is minimal compared to just trying to roll through it and it, it the blowups that are going to ensue. So like, it's, it's, that's awesome that she was doing that. And, and I have to I say hope, but, for, for teachers who do that, um, it is so satisfying as a teacher when you have a kid who's struggling with anything, either academically or socially or emotionally, if they're or or physically, if they're struggling with something, for a teacher to get to say, "Look, I see what's going on with you. I have a plan for you, and trust me, this is going to help." Like to be able to say that and actually have the goods to back it up is incredibly satisfying because I, I think the reason why teachers stay in teaching is not for the salary. It's because um, you get a chance to actually be transformational 
and and have just this big effect on students' lives. And I and all of our teachers want to be more effective. And uh, and we're just learning more and more about how they can be more effective in the classroom, and then also be more effective in their own lives. And 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 even if you um, are having other kind of difficulties, financial or, or otherwise, as a teacher, being able to uh, live a life of significance is it is uh, make sure it kind of animates your entire life and and. Um, you know, you get out of bed in the morning and you and you can say, "Look, I might not be feeling great right now, but I know that what I'm doing is really important." And and just having that feeling when you wake up in the morning is a good feeling. And by the way, I'm not saying that we shouldn't pay teachers more because we we should te- we should pay them at uh, Finland levels. Yes. Now, and that's probably exactly why um, <clears throat> that, that she didn't want to go and teach those other other grades, which I, I'm sure they wanted her to do AP and that kind of thing because she was really good. Uh, but she could do the most good right where, where she was at. She wanted to be where she could do the most good um, for administrators. We have a lot, of, a lot of administrators that listen and they probably do with a lot of these same issues. If they're hearing this about trauma informed teaching for the first time, which is probably not the first time for them, I, I assume. Um, but where would they start if they wanted to implement this in their school? Should they start with a teacher, a grade level, teach the whole staff? What, what should they do? Yeah, good. So, good question. Um, I uh, first of all, like um, you, Jordan, my uh, my dad was a uh, was an administrator, was a principal, um, and also a teacher. My mo- mom was a teacher. My wife is an elementary school teacher, so it sort of surrounded me. And um, and in terms of like, so let's let's say uh, administrator has uh, has sort of acknowledged and wants to pursue trauma informed uh, teaching PD. Here's where I'd start. Um, we know that, uh, teachers are under a huge amount of stress and, uh, this, this, uh, concept of secondary traumatic stress is a real identified state. And what happens then with that is that when teachers are around, uh, kids who are living in chaos, they, uh, their nervous system is impacted with that. Their mirror neurons and ner- their nervous system is impacted by that in a huge way. And they start to become less powerful in their lives because they start to display the symptoms. They're starting to disassociate. They're starting to have maybe more withdrawal, resisting things. Fear is, is happening. There's a lot of things that occur with secondary traumatic stress. And uh, the best of us are vulnerable to this because really we don't want teachers who don't have an open heart. We we want the best teachers are those that have an open heart, the incredible, incredible, incredibly empathetic, and uh, we need teachers to be that way. But when your heart is wide open and you're dealing with a whole lot of chaos, uh, that starts to shut you down. And so, if teachers don't have resilience strategies, or, or an administrator who's just listening. And, and saying, tell me what's going on with you. How are you doing? I'm here to listen. Uh, if, if they don't have that, then the condition gets worse. So I'd start with uh, teaching students, uh, teaching teachers about uh, how to uh, deal with their secondary traumatic stress. Um, and then I think the next part I would do is I would look at uh, maybe shifting to PLC, uh, professional learning community work. PLCs. Um, don't work like they were intended to work. Uh, they were ad- originally sort of organic communities of teachers that got together. They wanted to get better at teaching. They thought they could do this better in groups. They would focus on certain things. They'd go practice those things in the classroom. They'd come back from those I- experiences in the classroom and they'd say, here's what worked, here's what didn't work. And I think trauma-informed instruction is perfect for that because not only do teachers learn about th- the strategies that are successful, but um, the entire group of teachers, many of them will have the same students in common. They'll actually learn, oh, that worked with that student, or I didn't even realize that that student had uh, that kind of trauma going on. That's that's going to really change the way I deal with that student. So that's why PLCs are really important. Uh, and I, I just have one more uh, kind of a, maybe a controversial thing to say, and that is that I think that we in schools bring in too many experts and we uh, pay them too much money to come in and uh, tell teachers what to do. And oftentimes, I think this is insulting to teachers 
particularly when you might not realize that there is someone in the classroom classroom there at that school who has the expertise or there's someone in the community and there may be a parent or someone nearby who would be happy to, to come in and interact. And so what's useful about that is that, uh, you know, experts go away after a time. Whereas if you have, say, a teacher who, who has a whole lot of emotional high IQ and they are also uh, really knowledgeable, uh, knowledgeable about like where to find the trauma indicators like it's at the NEA site, then they can introduce this stuff. And then later, as teachers are encountering things, they can go to that particular staff member and uh, talk about their situation too. So, uh, And it's a lot less expensive. Or go ahead and pay those teachers a little more for doing, <laughs> for doing that. Um, I think that's a good way of... So <clears throat> I, I, this is something I think I've, I've talked about once or twice, but <clears throat> I worked for an administrator who... He, he leaned on that kind of model pretty hard and he would elevate the folks in his building to, you know, teach others, which I think is, is huge for the culture of your school and that ongoing education piece of it, because that person's still there, that matters a lot. And there's just something about when you're in a room and like PD can, can get kind of a, um, you could like teachers can be kind of turned off by it, but when it's their colleague up there, that's a little different because like, you know what I mean? Like they know that person, they want to hear what they have to say. I think that helps. So I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because that kind of brings us back to the um, school culture piece. Um, if uh, somebody listed wanted to take back um, trauma-informed care, so not, not really administrator, but think like, like you're talking to teachers here. If, if you know, they, they don't have control over initiatives in their whole building, but they do their classroom, what, where would they start? Yeah. Uh, so there's an organization called the Trauma Resource Institute. And they have something called CRM, CRM, which stands for Community Resiliency Model. And it's a nonprofit, and its goal is to distribute this knowledge to not just schools, but um, the community in general, realizing that trauma is epidemic and dealing with it uh, in a way that's ineffective is also <laughs> epidemic. So... Uh, its whole mission is to get people more knowledgeable about all these tools that are, are available. And so a lot of their initial trainings are free. It's a good place to start with that. Um, and then I'd also, and, and by the way, uh, I am interacting with the people who are, are expert in that model. And at ECU, where I work, uh, there is an initiative to make more professors um, knowledgeable about this and not just professors, but also secretaries and department chairs, like how, do, like, how are you more effective with human Makes beings? Uh, and, and so, yeah, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, there's a school in Tennessee and I forget what it was. It's a <coughs> university and I forget the, I forget the name of it is somewhere in Tennessee and their entire, uh, all of the prof professors and all of the staff, uh, and department chairs, administrators, all of them were trained in trauma, uh, informed pedagogy. And, you know, they, they said that what happened then is you had fewer students that were dropping out of, of college because of that, because you, you had people who had the tools to, um, be, be more helpful to, uh, to students. Um, so I'd, so I'd say that's a really good place to start. And then also, um, on social media, I'm at Finley T, uh, like on Twitter. So just, um, uh, let me know and I'll send you stuff on, on that. I have sort of a, a huge collection of readings on it that are, that are useful. So I'm happy. That's to great. We're going to link to, uh, to that and we'll link to you in the, in the show notes and it'll be on the description on the podcast. Um, the last thing I, I want to leave us with there, because what you mentioned there about what ECU is doing, it, <clears throat> particularly folks that ever lurked in, in a large school that have a big front office staff or even a small school that just has the one person in the front, train that person too. If you're, if you're going to do this because they are, they're, they're face front with everybody that comes through the building and they, they have to do, have all these interactions. A lot of them are naturally good at this kind of thing. Anyways, it's, it's why they do those jobs like the front desk secretary and attendance clerks and that kind of thing. But that, that's a good idea because like if they, this is the kind of thing that they, they would be helpful toward too. So think about training your whole staff and that stuff, not just your, your teaching staff, but um, Todd, uh, you've got uh, teachers to prepare and you've got, you know, students to teach and I don't want to take up too much of your day and we really appreciate you. Um, um, so we're going to link all that. Go ahead. 
I, I just want to say, I can't tell you how much I've really enjoyed this. And thank you for your interest in, in this subject. I certainly care a lot about it. I, both of you, by the way, have great interpersonal skills. So congratulations on that. Um, I've enjoyed meeting with you and interacting with you. I, I wish you were closer. We could have another three-hour conversation about all this. That would be great. The Flywheel Effect, harnessing the power of momentum to create a school culture that celebrates change and drives itself. <laughs>